Welcome back to chapter six. So this video is going to cover the main problem type that comes out of chapter six. It's not the last lecture video from chapter six, but it is the one that is the core problem solving problem type that we want to focus our attention on. So the idea of acceleration is that any acceleration is a change in velocity. So what we've seen so far in our course has mostly been objects that are speeding up or objects that are slowing down. But an object can accelerate if it's even just changing direction while staying at the same what we would think of as speed. So if we think about an object that is moving in a circle, so if we think about a circle in a parking lot on a map, we could be going east to south to west to north and around and around and around. We want to think about where the acceleration would point if we think about the average acceleration for a small portion of that circle. What we need to keep in mind here is way back in chapter three, when we thought about vector addition and subtraction, we thought about the fact that if you have one vector minus another, we can handle that by just having there be this opposite vector. So with that in mind, if we think about starting a circle where we were going east, that's the black arrow indicated as initial velocity, and then we're moving south, that's a blue arrow indicated with final velocity, the idea of taking final velocity minus initial velocity means we need to add the negative of that eastward arrow, which means we've created a west or left pointing arrow here, and I've drawn it in red. So for that chunk of the circle, basically that quarter of the circle, the average acceleration is pointing to the southwest, which is towards the center of the circle. If we extend that in a more general way, thinking about any time frame over which we are going in circles, the acceleration will always be pointing towards the center of the circle. The phrase centripetal acceleration is one that we're going to see all of the time in this chapter, and the word centripetal means center seeking. It points toward the center. Now, if we think about circular motion, the path of the sun, the moon, and even the stars through the sky as they go around and around from our perspective, a lot of that is just the earth rotating, but these motions that ancient Greek philosophers could look at all throughout the sky, they saw all of these circles, and so they decided that circles just had to be natural motions, that if you just let things be, circles would happen. That's not true. In order to have a circle, there has to be a force that is specifically causing that circular motion. For the moon going around the earth and the earth going around the sun, gravity is the force causing that circle. We will be talking about a more generalized understanding of gravity in this chapter at the very end. But if we think about a mass on a string, so let's say that we have a mass and I'm twirling it around my head um, and the string broke. If we imagine looking at this circle when the string breaks, what happens to that mass? Well, it moves in a straight line tangent to the direction of where it was when the string broke. This idea that we had in the first part of the chapter of tangential speed is telling us that if at any point we just cut off those forces, the object is gonna move in a straight line. We thought about the idea of inertia back in chapter four, and it's that same idea here. The reason why we have circles is there's a force that is constantly preventing that object from moving in a straight line, constantly changing the direction of motion, which means it is changing the velocity even if we're moving in a constant speed. You can try this at home with an object tied to a string, maybe in an open space or um, in a yard if you have one. Just let go and have a sense of where the um, object moves when you let go. And you can 
kind of convince yourself through practice that it will be tangent to where the point was when you first let it go. So it is always handy to see where equations come from, especially when they look brand new or they seem to come out of nowhere. Normally when we're on campus, we do a long derivation on the board to make sure we understand that the stuff that we have built in previous chapters of understanding is being used to get the new equation that's going to be on the next slide. I'm not going to do that derivation here in the lecture video, but we will have a one-page derivation PDF posted on Blackboard um, at some point this week. Please just review it once to make sure you have a sense of what pieces went into this new idea. In the same way that if you have a packaged um, food that you've never had before, you're going to at least glance at the nutrition facts and the ingredients so that you know what it is you're about to consume. It's the same kind of idea here. We have a new equation here. It's for centripetal acceleration. So cent is short form of centripetal. And there are two ways that we can write it. So we've kind of written both together. The centripetal acceleration can either be written as the tangential speed v squared over r, or r times the angular speed omega squared. In the first case, we have uh, v squared over r, meters per second, that whole thing squared divided by meters, ends up with our expected meters per second squared unit. In the second case, the r, the radius, is not squared, only the omega is. The r is in meters, omega is in radians per second, the radians will poof, disappear, and we will end up with the same meters per second squared units that we expect for accelerations since the start of our understanding in chapter two. We still have the knowledge that the net forces in a problem are equal to mass times acceleration. But here in chapter six, if we are moving in a circle, those net forces are equal to mass times specifically this centripetal acceleration. We basically have a deeper understanding of a tool we've already been using as long as we're talking about circular motion problems. The centripetal acceleration and therefore the net force will always be pointing toward the center of the circle. That is so fundamental to the problem uh, the problems that we will see in chapter six, that you should write that down in all capital letters in your notebook, highlighted, starred, whatever you need to do, but the centripetal acceleration is always toward the center of the circle, and that means that the net force is always toward the center of the circle. Okay, now our textbook, and so OpenStax Tutor, does use the idea of centripetal force as a phrase to talk about the net force in a circle motion problem. That isn't ideal for us because centripetal force as a term really isn't a new force at all. It's kind of something in common with Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. Uh, we talk about those uh, ideas a lot, those concepts, but when you look really hard for them in reality, they're not really there. They're not a special separate thing that exists. When we think about centripetal force, we really don't want to draw that into our free body diagram because that's indicating that it's this some brand new force, which is not the case. Centripetal force is simply a way to describe the total forces in a circle motion problem, so we should never draw a separate centripetal force in our free body diagram, and really we should never be writing out F cent. You will see it in the textbook problems. We can't really fully avoid that phrasing, but it really isn't a new different force. Gravity is a force. Normal force is a force. Tension is a force. Those things can cause circular motion. They might be the forces that are equal to mass times centripetal acceleration, 
There is no brand new centripetal force. All right. I've hopefully gotten that out of the way. You won't ever see me write that in um, our example problems. Please try not to write it yourself when you're doing problem sets. It tells me that you're not paying attention to our methods and you're relying too heavily on external forces, uh, external sources. Okay. So we're going to have a lot of example videos for this section because this is, as I mentioned, our primary problem type. So our first problem um, from this section, second problem for the chapter, is a flat circle. We have a uh, mass on a table that's going around in circles because it's attached to a rope. And we're trying to figure out the tension in the string. We'll see how that works. We'll see the problem solving process. But fundamentally, it is still using our understanding from chapter four that we draw a free body diagram. We use F net equals MA. And the one extra step is that acceleration can now be specified as V squared over R or R omega squared. This second example is different because it is an up and down um, circle. So in this example, gravity is going to play a role when it wasn't towards the center of the circle in the flat um, example. This early pair of problems, CB and CC, <laughs> 6B and 6C, they will help you apply our understanding to all of the later problems if we keep in mind the big difference between a flat circle and a vertical circle. But the underlying process is still the same for both. So we'll see separate videos for those. And it's worth noting that at the top of the circle, in the vertical circle, all of the forces that we're going to draw point straight down. A lot of students decide that that can't possibly be the case. If there's multiple forces, they have to be in opposite directions. But we have absolutely seen situations where the only force we have is straight down. Projectile motion is that ex example entirely. Gravity is the only force acting on a projectile as it goes through and um, has the motion that we talked about all throughout chapter three. And in this case, when we have a um, mass on a string, because there are multiple forces pointing downwards, we can actually have this thing move faster and in a tighter loop than if we were just to throw it across the room and have projectile motion be the way that we describe it. Now, it's important to think about a couple of um, extreme cases. If we have something moving in a circle that it goes too fast or it goes too slow, what the possibilities are. So if I swing an object around in a circle, very, very fast, and I swing that same object really slow, when is the tension in the rope higher in those two situations? So pause the video and think through it. All right. If we think about what's causing that circle, the tension is that net force, or it is at least contributing to that net force, and the faster I go, the bigger the centripetal acceleration is and the bigger the net force has to be. So the tension in the rope is a lot higher when the object is moving quickly in a um, swinging an object around on a rope kind of problem. If we kept swinging faster and faster, eventually, eventually the tension would get too big and the rope would break. Now, if the tension goes to zero, the rope goes slack. In that case, we no longer have a circle anymore. We don't have a big enough number um, to have that circular motion happen, and the object won't continue to move in circles. In class, I swing a bucket of water around and around in, uh, over my head and everything, and I'll try to find a um, YouTube video to link into, um, but it is cold enough at this point in the semester that I'm not going to do it outside. Um, but the idea is if we have a bucket of water that we're holding the handle of that bucket, if we swing it around fast enough, the water stays in the bucket. The normal force is keeping it moving in circles instead of dropping down and drenching me in water. If I go too slowly though, the water as it's about to come around 
there's not enough forces keeping it circling and it drops down and I get soaked. The point at which that occurs, we can show um, that it has to do with the size of the circle. All it is is just setting the tension or the normal force or whatever force is causing the circle, setting that to zero. Um, so that's the situation with a vertical circle. And we'll see that show up. It's not a fundamental new tool, um, but we will see why that happens in certain cases. So depending on how the vertical circle looks, when that kind of situation occurs where we don't have circular motion anymore, it will look different depending on if we're thinking about an object on the inside of a circle compared to if we're on the outside of a circle. Let me walk us through what I mean by that. If we think about a um, car in a roller coaster loop, or for safety reasons, let's think about a toy car going around a loop track that we've just cut in half. If we had this kind of thing where it was going really quickly around the loop and then it gets to the top, it should be able to continue the loop. But if we have cut off that um, extra half, it will just go flying across the room. If it goes really fast, it's become a projectile problem and it goes pretty far before it falls. But if it goes too slow, it will drop. So roller coasters actually have to go very fast in order to be able to complete the loops that they do. And there's a lot of physics calculations that go into what is the minimum speed you're allowed to have in order to have that be a safe ride that doesn't lose um, the connection at all. And if we think about this extra fast speed, we can tell that the track is in fact causing that circle to happen, which means the normal force of the surface of the track is causing that circle. And this animation kind of shows what those forces look like as the object is going around in a big circle. So I'll have that be playing for a little bit. But what I want you to think about, maybe while you watch this go around a couple of times, what I want you to think about is what is happening to these same pair of forces, gravity and normal force, when you're in a car that's going um, through the bottom of a valley in a road, going really fast through that valley versus um, going really fast over the top of that hill. If we think about going extremely fast in the bottom of the valley, we feel like pushed into our seats. That feeling is because the normal force has gotten really big. And as I have mentioned in previous videos, our feeling of how much we weigh is really just based on how the surfaces around us interact with, our, um, with ourselves in a force um, kind of context. So when we experience big normal forces, we feel heavy. And when we experience low normal forces, we feel light or weightless. So if we think about going too fast at the bottom of that valley in our car, we feel pressed in, we feel really heavy. If we think about going too fast over the top of a round hill, and some of you may have done this before in your cars, um, either on purpose or not, you might even catch a little air. When that happens, you've stopped having circular motion because you were going too fast. The reason why that breaking point idea happened when you were going too fast is because the normal force is away from the center of the circle. Gravity is towards the center of the circle for that top of the hill idea. If that doesn't make sense, draw a picture and it might help. And the next example we're about to see will be that same situation. And gravity is the thing allowing us to have a circle motion. But if we go too fast, gravity is a set number. It can only hold us down attached to the road as long as we aren't going in a circle too quickly. If we compare to the roller coaster situation, if we go too fast at the bottom of the loop or the top of the loop, we just feel pressed into our seats in both of those cases. In the situation of going too slow, as we saw in the previous 
half loop ride too slow means we lose that circle. Same with the bucket of water um, visual example. Okay, so with those kinds of situations in mind, and the next time that you're in a car and you have a hill and you go a little bit too fast and start to feel a little bit lifted out of your seat, it's this physics that's happening in that kind of situation. So we're going to see this example problem as a fully separate problem um, that we'll be able to talk through in a separate example video. But we'll see what those forces look like and we'll comment on um, the fact that this person is standing on a scale, whether that scale is reading more or less than their weight. This is the last example from this particular section of the, um, of the slides of the chapter. And this is one that we normally set up an in-class experiment for. I will describe what that experiment does and why it's contributing to our given information in the problem. But the one thing I'll say for now, because you won't be able to solve it otherwise before watching the video, is our goal is to figure out the coefficient of static friction by finding the radius where we break static friction. So the video will have a lot more in it. Um, normally we have an actual turntable and an actual penny and we're going through in class, um, but we'll be talking through that in the example video. The car circling on a level road, we will see in problem sets and it's the same free body diagram that we drew or we will have drawn for the penny example in example 6e. So that's worth noting because just like the penny on the turntable, the penny slides off if friction can't hold it in place. A car driving around in circles in a parking lot, if it goes too quickly, it will slide out of the circle and it will have broken static friction. Sliding in a car is not a good thing if we're trying to have control of that car. And that's the situation where we go too fast, um, just like with the car going over a level hill or going over a, the top of a hill or um, the bucket of water going a little too slow. The key thing for all of these problems is to make sure we understand why the forces look the way they do and which ones are contributing to the circular motion and not just the nuts and bolts of this is what we did in step one, this is what we did in step two. We want to be able to kind of think ahead to what types of forces are causing these circles and apply them to all of the real world examples that we experience. If you have ever, in Michigan winter, um, turned a corner in your car and there's a little bit too much ice or slush on the road, you will have felt the fact that you have lost static friction on your tires. And that's because that friction force was not enough to keep you moving in that circle. You were going too quickly, even if it was only 10 miles an hour, because with the ice there, the friction's really low. Same thing would happen if you watch any kind of Fast and the Fur Furious or Tokyo Drift movies. When they go faster on curves, you um, drift out. And that's, again, because you're breaking static friction. You're just doing so with a normal amount of friction force, but very, very fast speeds. So think about all of those things as you're applying our um, tools to real realistic problems. I said the penny example was the last in this section, and I forgot that there's one more in this section, section. and it's our um, first situation where we have to remind ourselves that forces are allowed to be at angles and still be contributing to our problems. So this example is probably one of the harder ones just because we have to remind ourselves of breaking things into sines and cosines and recognizing how the circle shows up here as being a flat circle. So we'll see that in its own separate example video. And this situation of a, um, a mass on a string that is moving in a circle where the string itself is causing that flat motion, it actually is a very similar example to a banked curve problem. Racetracks that have a banked curve actually are very different than at first glance we might think of these as incline ramp chapter four problems, but that's not the case. These 
cars are not moving up or down the ramp at all. They are still moving in a flat horizontal circle. So when we look at the forces that are causing that circular motion, it's actually a part of the normal force that causes that circling to happen. So um, this kind of situation is going to look very similar to the full example problem, 6F. And there is an additional problem that's two dimensions and a little bit tougher than we need if you want to push your understanding about keeping track of X and Y forces when we have a circle problem. This is the first time that I'll note it, but it won't be the last time that I note that there is a separate set of slides in what's called the appendix for this chapter that is posted right next to the slides, condensed note-taking versions of this chapter. And it contains a whole bunch of different topics where we go into more depth in that appendix if you're interested in reading through them. But all of that stuff is not essential to our core goals for our curriculum, which is why they're separated out and you're not going to hear me talk through them in additional lecture videos. Please do at least read through it once, but you don't have to fully understand the stuff that shows up in that appendix if it's just a little bit beyond what you're comfortable with. That's okay. That's why it's kind of set aside. So our reminders from the very first lecture video, we learned a, about a whole bunch of new kind of definitional ideas. We learned what tangential velocity was in this context, what angular speed is in this context, how they relate to each other. All these things are being used in the core problem type out of chapter six, which fundamentally is just thinking about forces again, where the one extra step compared to chapter four is recognizing that the net force points towards the center and that the centripetal acceleration can be specified beyond just a number value in meters per second squared. We can think about V squared over R or R omega squared. So you'll see all of those example videos next and hopefully things will start to make more sense how we apply this exact process to all of those examples and we'll start to see the keys to chapter six um, as we practice more and more with this topic. Thanks for listening. I will see you in those next videos.